exponentially faster, massively parallel, maximal matching. So, uh, take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about another massively parallel algorithm, this time for solving the maximal matching problem. This is based on a joint work with my advisor, Mohamed Haji Ghai, and uh, David Harris, who's here. Uh, so, I think the previous talk uh, was basically as good as it can get on describing the model, so I'm going to basically just repeat. So, we were given this graph G, it has n vertices, m edges, and it has maximum degree delta. Uh, our parameter will be delta here. And we have m machines, each with a space s. s is much smaller than m, so we don't, uh, so, so we can't uh, store the whole graph into one machine. Computation proceeds in rounds. By the end of each round, each machine can send and receive a total of up to s bits of information. So again, we continue doing computations and communications until we solve the problem. And the goal, again, is to optimize the number of rounds and its trade-off with the space available for machine. So our focus is on the maximal matching problem. And I emphasize on the maximality. So the, the left matching here is a maximal matching. But the matching on the right is not maximal because you can add an edge to it. Okay, so let me start by saying why maximal matching. First of all, it's one of the big four symmetry breaking problems, along with maximal independent set, delta plus one vertex coloring, and two delta minus one edge coloring. You get studied in various different settings, so it's important to understand what's the uh, computational complexity of maximal matching in this model. But on top of that, it also has some cool applications. So for example, if you have a TRAM MPC algorithm for maximal matching, or in fact, any other O of one approximate maximum matching, you can boost it up to one plus epsilon or down to one plus epsilon approximation for maximum matching in essentially the same uh, asymptotic number of rounds. So though, though this, this uh, O notation hides the dependence on epsilon, but if epsilon is some constant, it's going to be O of T round algorithm. And it also gives a true approximation of minimum vertex cover, and which is uh, optimal under uh, the unique games conjecture, and if we restrict our machines to run polynomial time algorithms. And note that this does not hold even for one plus epsilon approximate maximum matchings. Okay? So if you have a one plus epsilon approximate maximum matching, you don't necessarily have a good approximation of minimum vertex cover. So the maximality property, property is important. And it's not already, uh, it's already visible why uh, maximal matching is harder than uh, approximate matching, but there is also at least why it's not uh, easier. But it's also, in a sense, very harder because so typical algorithms that find an O of one approximate maximum matching, what they do is, for example, you get all the high degree nodes. You run some algorithm. You say, okay, a constant fraction of these vertices will be matched. Now you find a constant a matching that's at least a constant fraction of these nodes. And now you can afford to remove all of these high degree nodes and reduce the degree of your graph. Right? But this is clearly not possible if you want to find a maximal matching. You have to match every vertex that you remove from the graph, or at least all of their neighbors should be matched. Okay. And if you have an algorithm that finds such, that matches only a constant fraction of the vertices, you would have to repeat this log n number of times until you match every vertex. Right? So the non-algorithms for approximate maximum matching uh, will be blown up by a factor of log n if we want to maintain maximality. So in this work, we show that uh, maximal matching admits efficient algorithms in the massively parallel computations model by improving the previous algorithms exponentially in the number of rounds. So basically, we show that if the space available per machine is O of n, when n is the number of nodes in the graph, uh, we need only log log delta number of rounds to find the maximal matching. Previous algorithms all require polylogarithmic uh, number of rounds. And we show that if the space term machine is n to one plus delta for any delta, we need only log of one over delta number of rounds. And the first result uh, sort of improves all the previous algorithms that only work within the same number of rounds on a space, but work only for approximate matching, not for 
maximal matching. And so they all had approximations for vertex cover strictly worse than two. And the second result also improves an algorithm of latency et al from spot 18 uh, exponentially there. They had a, using a space n to one plus delta, their algorithms required one over delta number of times. Okay, so a uh, very useful tool for solving matchings in the massive power computations model, and the space is largely linear in n, is vertex partitioning. This was first used by the, uh, in the influential paper of Chumaj et al in the stock 18. So for matching, this is how it works. Let delta be the remaining maximum degree in the graph. Suppose that you partition the vertices into root delta uh, partitions and send the induced subgraph of each partition to a different uh, machine, right? So this is our graphs. Each vertex picks its partition independently at random and uh, we send each of these induced subgraphs to a different machine. Not that we ignore all the edges that uh, have different uh, partitions for their endpoints, right? And now that we put all of these uh, induced subgraphs in different machines, we can now find a sequential, run a sequential algorithm on these induced subgraphs and find a matching. And after doing this, we can just commit these edges to the final output because these partitions are vertex disjoint. And remove all the vertices from the graph that are matched, right? So what remains in the graph after doing this is this, uh, is a set of these black node, the black edges that are shown in the figure. And I would have to note that this vertex partitioning idea is not just used for matching, it has also been used for minimum spanning trees or graph coloring algorithms and uh, many other problems. Uh, but I uh, only talk about its applications and the matching problem here. So how do we argue that uh, this leads to a fast, massively parallel maximal matching algorithm? So a natural idea is to argue that, well, after each application of this procedure, the graph that remains is much sparser than the previous graph. So that after a few iterations of this procedure, we have essentially nothing to uh, uh, match, and we find a maximal match. And to argue that this sparsification happens, it turns out that it's very important uh, how we find these uh, matching edges in each of these in, uh, induced subgraphs. So even though these are uh, sequential algorithms run on a graph that you have uh, access to all of its edges, it's important how you match these vertices in order to be able to argue that the remaining degree in the graph drops significantly. And in fact, this is how uh, the previous works uh, differ. M most of them use this vertex partitioning idea, at least all of them for in this linear uh, memory regime use vertex partitioning idea, but the algorithms they run on these induced subgraphs are different. And in fact, in, in their paper, Chumaj et al. posed this open problem. They, they use a, a fairly complicated algorithm in these, in these subgraphs. And they pose this open problem that they think a simpler algorithm that basically greedily matches the edges inside each of these induced subgraphs should work. Uh, but they left the analysis of these algorithms for the future work. And in this way, we show that actually the simplest as possible algorithm for matching has very nice properties that help us argue these graphs get sparsified uh, and eventually solve the problem in log log delta rounds. And the algorithm is random greedy maximal matching. So the random greedy maximal matching, you fix a random permutation over all the edges, iterate over these edges in this permutation, add any edge that you can to the match. At the end, you have a maximal match. So again, the algorithm says you vertex partition on each induced subgraph, you run random greedy maximal matching. And uh, time left, I would like to give you an overview of how we analyze the vertex degrees drop after this random procedure. So 
So more specifically, we show that for any vertex v in the graph, uh, the remaining degree of v drops to uh, strictly below, it is sublinear in delta. Okay, so if, if the maximum degree in the graph uh, could be up to delta, the degree of this node v could be up to delta, but we argue that there, its remaining degree after this algorithm and a minor cleanup procedure goes down to delta to uh, some constant that's smaller than one. Okay, and the, the main tool uh, that we use is to prove a concentration bound on this random variable, which I'll soon define. So recall that we fixed this vertex v. Now suppose that once we, we have fixed this vertex v, we partition all the other vertices in the graph and compute the maximal matching on these induced subgraphs. And for any partition i, we define z i to be the number of unmatched nodes, unmatched neighbors of this node v in that subgraph. So for example here, in this uh, partition one on the right, this vertex v has two neighbors, but both of them are matched, so z one will be zero. In the second partition, it has four neighbors, three of them are unmatched, so z two will be three, and so on. Z3 will be two and Z4 will also be two, right? And our main tool in proving that this sparsification happens is to prove that this, Z, this random variable Z is highly concentrated around its expected value. So let me describe why this concentration bound leads to this uh, argument. So suppose that we can prove such sharp concentration bound. Suppose that we prove that for every ZI, its value with high probability is uh, within an additive of delta to some small constant, say one fourth of its expected value. And all these zi's are symmetric. So the expected value of z1 is equal to the expected value of z2 and so on up to zk. So if they're all concentrated around their expectations, they're all concentrated around the same value. Right? And if we have such concentration for all of them, there are two cases. Either, the, the, either uh, uh, suppose that this vertex V will be assigned to a machine I. If this value of ZI is larger than zero, this means that this vertex V has at least one unmatched neighbor in that subgraph. So if we put V in that subgraph and run the random greedy maximal matching again using the same uh, randomness, this vertex V will be matched and removed from the graph, right? And if this is not the case, if, uh, if uh, this vertex, if there is some ZI in which this vertex has no unmatched neighbor, if there is some partition I, if this vertex is, matched, is assigned to that partition, is not going to be removed from the graph, is not going to be matched, then, since all of these zi's are uh, concentrated around the same value, all of them are going to be close to zero up to an additive factor of delta to one fourth. Right, so this basically shows that if zi is zero in at least one of these partitions, then some of these zi's, which is an upper bound on the remaining degree of this vertex after this procedure, is going to be a small, small enough. Right? Okay, so let's see how we can prove such concentration bound. Again, all these zi's are symmetric, so let's prove this concentration bound for z1. And we would like to prove that z1 is concentrated around its expected value. So what are the random variables here? So suppose that, so we denote this z1 uh, deliberately by z1 of x1 to xn to specify that this value of z1 is a, is a function of the partition of all these vertices. So xi here denotes the partition of vertex i, right? More specifically, xi denotes whether vertex i is part of partition one or not. If, it's, if x1, xi is one, say, vertex i is part of partition one, and if xi is zero, it's not part of part partition one. Now, if we have this vector x, we can uniquely determine the set of vertices in partition one, and we can run the greedy algorithm and determine the value of z. Right now, we want to prove concentration bound on z. Well, churn of half the inbounds are not sufficient. 
they prove concentration bounds on sum of independent random variables. Here Z is not really, Z1 is not really sum of independent random variables. Once you realize this vector X, you run a function on it and then uh, count the number of unmatched nodes. So it's not really uh, sum of independent random variables, so we can use Chernoff bounds. But there are tools uh, to prove concentration bounds on functions, more general functions than just sum of independent random variables. So for example, let's try Mackey-Hermes inequality, so, or also known as bounded differences inequality. So what it says is that, uh, suppose that we iteratively change the partition of vertices one by one, and ci is an upper bound on the change that this vertex i causes to the value of zi, right? So fix this ci is defined as the maximum possible uh, effect that vertex i can have on the value of zi. Now the cool property of random greedy maximal matching is that if you add or remove a vertex to the graph, and under the same permutation run maximal matching, the difference of the two matchings will be only one path. So there will be only at most one, two vertices of the endpoints of this path whose matches status changes. Right? So we know that CI is smaller than two for all i's. Right? So what this MacDermis inequality gives us having this uh, upper bound is basically such, uh, comes from this uh, inequality, the probability that Z1 deviates from its expected value by an additive factor of T is a smaller than e to minus t squared over sum of these ci's. Each of these ci's is a constant, so the denominator, the denominator becomes uh, theta of n. So what this gives us is that the deviation is no more than root n log n with high probability, right? So each, each z is within an additive factor of root n of its expected value. But recall that what we need is only dependence on delta. Why? Because these additive deviations are, the, this additive deviation times k is the remaining degree of a vertex. We would like to argue that, well, this uh, maximum degree delta gets a smaller and a smaller. So we don't want any dependence on n here. So we want to prove a concentration bound uh, that it does not depend on this dimension n of these random variables. And to prove this concentration bound, let me recall a very uh, beautiful uh, algorithm for determining whether an edge is part of this random greedy maximal matching or not. So suppose that we want to know whether this edge, which we know has a rank, say, k, uh, rank uh, 40 in the uh, permutation, is in the random greedy maximal matching or not. So this Recursive procedure was first uh, proposed by uh, Onak and Nguyen. So basically, you, what you first do is you, you reveal the lowest rank uh, edge connected to this edge 40, say this edge uh, 5. We recursively determine whether 5 is part of the maximal matching or not. For that, recursively, we uh, draw the lowest rank neighbor of this uh, edge five, say this edge two. And now suppose that all the neighbors of this edge two are of higher rank. What this means is that without the need to go any further, we will determine that this edge two will be part of the uh, maximal match. Right? Now let's go to the next, and, and that this edge five is not part of the matching because two is. And now let's go to the next edge of the sequence. Suppose that 10 is the next edge of uh, 4D. And with this recursion, we get that, okay, 10 is now part of uh, maximal matching, and because it is part of maximal matching, 4D is not part of the matching, right? So, so we now look only at the small subgraph of the graph and determine whether 4D is part of the maximal matching or not. Now the question is, what is the expected size of these recursion trees? And the reason that this has been studied was for uh, a study of sublinear algorithms. We want fast sublinear algorithms. But here we actually use this very beautiful result of Yoshida et al. It's proved in stock 09 uh, to prove a concentration bound. So the result basically is that the expected average query size uh, for each edge in the graph is poly delta, right? And 
having this poly delta dependency, we cannot plug this into that concentration bound and prove a concentration bound that is that does not depend on the dimension n, but only on, dimension, on the maximum degree. Delta, though, there is a technicality that we cannot, uh, that that's a hard threshold, uh, but we want expected threshold, so we end up using a second moment method. And these are technicalities, but I think the takeaway message is that these sublinear algorithms may have many different uh, applications in proving concentration bounds that I found to be very yeah. useful. Thanks. Uh, can you explain why? So basically, if the degrees get the smaller and the small. Oh, sorry. Let me repeat. Does it work when uh, memory formation is sublinear? And yeah, so basically, our argument is that the degrees get the smaller and the smaller. When the degrees get to some constant, you can still have O of n edges in the graph. Though, if the degrees are small, you can solve them. This is not really the problem. But the problem is that. Uh, Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, but this vertex partition that does not work for the domain remnants. Question asked is that what is the process where n to c has sublinear space? Yeah, if it's n to epsilon space, this technique does not work. This is this is for only for linear or more. Okay. So is it possible to make it work in semi streaming? No, so this so first of all, in the streaming model, maximal matching is trivial. You just, uh, right, so you're asking about the reduction that gets it up to one minus epsilon approximation. So that reduction does actually work in this. That was first developed for the streaming uh, setting, but it requires many different number of paths, passes over the stream. It's not one pass, it's O of one passes. And it hides epsilon factor. 